sorry, we already had our first question, um, which is uh, uh, note that homelessness wasn't a word that sort of came up in any of the overview, and is that germane here? Um, and I would say absolutely it is germane. I would say it's probably more, the adaptive downtown is more of the infrastructure um, group. And so this is more about like the emergency response. So if there was homelessness that was sort of caused in the emergency response, I think also um, Suzanne is here from the long-term recovery group that's really supporting individuals. Um, I'm wondering what's being done now. What I saw, okay. I, I'm a resident, my name's David Hart and I, I reside, I live in Montpelier. Um, but it seemed at first all of the, the disparate needs that came down with the water have siphoned and sifted and formed, as quite often happens, uh, into actions that look great. I, th I really commend the, the folks that are behind it. But one of the few parties that I think are stakeholders are the ones that do not have property, yes. do not have houses. Mm -hmm. and, and unless we can figure out how to include them in now as well as in the future and then not shift and push it into it. I mean, I really feel like people are just being ignored. Mm -hmm. There are other human beings. Yeah. And yeah. that's my statement. Great. I really appreciate that. And I wonder, um, well, I yes, go ahead. To, sure. Um, I'm Tori Rodine, a part of the city mm -hmm. um, homelessness task force. Great. And um, the, the task force and the city are, um, as well as Good Samaritan Haven, um, and another way, are taking some action to support the um, many people who were unhoused before the flood, whose lives have become materially worse mm -hmm. since the time of the flood. But but you're right, it's absolutely, it's, it, it's a huge burning question right now, and there are people working on it. But I also shared that concern that um, the, um, that's a basic a basic part of emergency response and so I um I, I came to this really out of a general concern for social support and mental health support as well as for support of unhoused people in town um, in in the wake of the flood and, and I agree that that needs to be part of the conversation um, the task force meets um, the first and third Wednesday of every month and the public is welcome at task force meetings I would really welcome you to come if if you aren't already doing that. I'm and, doing enough other things, but okay. I still have a concern. Yeah, de definitely. Um, not yeah. forgetting people yeah, who absolutely. don't have residences. And yeah. this is a national problem. It's yeah. not just here. Right, but it's it's a burning it's a burning problem in Montpelier, and there are people actively trying to address it, and, and it is much worse since the flood, mm -hmm. in part because places where people had previously been able to camp out of doors yeah. are no longer... Mm -hmm available. Thank you for your work. And this is exactly the type of conversation we're hoping to have today, right? Sure. We're identifying priorities, identifying mm -hmm. umbrella goals, want to hear from you all. And I'd love to note um, that this feels maybe like it's lacking in our early materials. Dan. Hi. Uh, I would actually really like sort of the outline that you were putting yeah. on the, you know, I, I've been hoping to see something like this yeah. begin to emerge. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What, uh, what do you see the process of actually getting this uh, implemented, uh, you know, is is this council action? Is this, uh, you know, do do you have an action process that we should be involved in? I'm, I'm curious how, how you see this moving from here on. You, you mean holistically all of it, or specifically the emergency operations Disaster plan? Response plan. The, the, the emergency response plan. Is, uh, uh, is, yes. I, see, yeah. the fa the failures last summer, I think, pointed out what we uh, really need to know. Yeah. So, and, uh, and the ground is still wet. So. Yeah, and December was a great, the, the, you know, uh, second round of, oh my gosh, you know, how we didn't have as many blue skies as is the official term we're learning as we thought, right? And that had a, a uh, kind of, a, as it left, a neon sign saying, I'll be back, so. Yes, great point. And Mark, by the way, just introduced, is also here from our work group. Um, so this is something, uh, those of us on this group are very concrete thinkers, so we're actually quite excited to have this concept of a local emergency operations plan. There, it is done. It is like a science, you know? And so we um, basically, our thought is that we have already talked to the city and they are 100% supportive of basically uh, us coming in and supporting capacity here, a focus on
writing this plan, understanding the stakeholders, and um, you know having like technical experts come in to support the creation of that plan. And so our timeline is potentially a little ambitious, but to have sort of it draft started to be drafted up by July, by the anniversary of the flood, we have the bones of this plan. And the thing is, we have a we have a current plan in place. But you might, those who might be more familiar with emergency response, it's more of a continuing operations plan of sort of where do the functions of state government go and how do they continue. And what was really missing was the volunteers and the businesses and residents and what do we do and where do we go and who's the authority. And, 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 in, the, and in the city, the, you know, there was actually no response to who specifically was supposed to inform people of what, who was supposed yes. to call the National Guard, who was supposed to do exactly. any of the stuff that would be required to help get uh, things mobilized. Yes. And so I would love to see something that could actually happen before June. Well, that's a great point. So, of course, we're going to be as moving as fast. Again, the December flood was a wake-up call of this idea of blue skies. There's not that many blue skies for us. That We really do need to be working fast on this. So our thought is get a contractor in who has deep experience in this, allowed them to add capacity, you know, and, but again, we're gonna, you're gonna see some facilitated engagement of residents, businesses, and uh, volunteers, you know, what was your experience, what worked, what didn't work. There's also like technical stuff here too, like software, volunteer activation software, again, that exists. So we actually put something in place overnight here. Can we use that? Did that work? Or should we use this national software? So there's a lot of details underlying that. But that's the idea is basically the city's like, yes, please. We need to do this. We want to move with alacrity. Thank you for working with us on this and basically putting a, a spotlight on it. And, and one more thing. I, do, I noticed you talked about neighborhood or community yes. response. Having had some experience with the original CAM yes. uh, effort. Exactly. The, um, the biggest problem is finding neighborhood leaders who will actually maintain lists, do the outreach, et cetera. So some form of rewarding or engaging people that uh, will take on those leadership roles is crucial to, you know, so it's nice to talk about that, but there has to be an actually a, a concrete organizing plan for the leadership. Great point. So one other thing, there are trainings Vermont Emergency Management trainings for the folks who are going to be in charge of this in the city. Um, and there's like an operations like, you know, center that's like that crops up in emergency, right? So there are all these components that are sort of known and done. There's trainings we're hooking folks up with. And then you practice it, right? You practice it, you see how it works. And part of that we've heard early in our research of the CAN network is just what you said. It's hard to sustain it in between emergencies. And so, you know, that's the question is, how do you find those leaders? How do you keep the CAN network simmering in between times of emergency? Um, so I see some other hands. I also would love to ask you all that question of what would have worked better for you, right? Like this is the sort of moment of brainstorm of, and do you have experience with the CAN network? What are your ideas that might make a CAN network just so everyone's on the same page? That's this local neighborhood like leadership, right? It's like, you have your designated neighborhood, you have a leader, you know what everybody needs, you know who got flooded, you know who needs a supply, right? You know, it's sort of like this like first pass alert and then support neighborhood by neighborhood, which we have had experiences, it was just alluded to um, in Montpelier. Adrian? I'll just respond to that and I have a question. So in our neighborhood, I'm the can leader. Um, there you go. Or, <laughs> I know. <laughs> what um, keeps you motivated? I <laughs> so I think the can neighborhood started up. So I live up off Deerfield, off Terrace. So hi, everyone who lives there. Um, we're, wait, what are we? Park, Park West. Park West. West. Park West. I, I always get all the Montpelier Park West neighborhood. And so we had, um, what worked really well for us was, um, getting fed information so that we could feed it out. And so we created um, mechanisms of communication through, um, we have a Facebook page, but then a lot of folks were like, well, I don't use Facebook. So we did a listserv. So we collected everyone's emails. And then we got down to the lower level, which is just going to talk to your neighbors. So I know mm -hmm. almost, I would say 80% of my neighbors just talking to them and understanding what their needs are. And, um, you know, and you should, we did that when there wasn't an emergency, right? So it's building that foundation and that relationship and taking the time and effort to understand your neighbors. Like, um, and then we had a little, like a board. I don't remember. We had those like, those, uh, like. Oh, oh, right. We had the. the, the like a sandwich the, the, board. The, the sandwich boards for uh, neighborhood. <laughs> and so that was another way of communication. So as soon as you pulled a neighborhood, we posted like um, 
flyers and information. So as people walked by, you know, if they didn't, you know, have email or Facebook or they didn't want to come out and talk to you, <laughs> it was like more of a passive way to like communicate information. So I personally like the CAN network. Um, I think it was a great way to bring the neighborhood together and inform people that was not activated during the flood at all because we were not given any information to pass along to our neighbors. So I think that was a break. That's an opportunity for improvement. Um, there but, has, there's no longer any city support for it. So, okay. Uh, they, well, even if, I mean, the, the structure exists. And so how do we continue to build that and think of a way to enhance it? Um, and I think it was just information that we needed to pass along. So I think that's just an opportunity for to improve. Before and then, you ask your question, yeah. I'll just make, and I know you have a question too. So Sorry. first of all, thank you for, for doing that. I think that there are some elements of it that still live. So one in, one component of all of this is either reviving, reinventing, reinvigorating, whatever the existing and old network, and then sort of improving upon that existing structure. And that is one of the sort of alert yes. methods that will go in conjunction with what the city is doing or what any other volunteer networks will be doing. There were so many things that happened this July that were, I mean, a lot of them were initiated by the city and then the city didn't sort of stand up and take credit for those things. So there were a lot of things that the city was doing. For example, setting up the, the hub, tasking the parks department and Montpelier Alive to sort of run that thing was an effort of the city. Um, and a lot of things happened because we, we got lucky. We had some of the right people in the right places at the right time and they just made it work. So part of the work that we're doing is figuring out who is aware of the CAN network, who was part of the volunteer hub, what did the city do, what did individual businesses do that did or didn't work, and then trying to piece all those things together into the toolkits that we're talking about and bring all that together into one larger, more robust plan. Yes. Sorry, before we go there, I think I Adrian did have a really question. Thing. We'll I, think, I don't know if it's part of your plan. I hope it is. But one of the things that was missing during the response was an opportunity for improvement was including the um, public health department. Mm -hmm. So the state public health department, um, I work in public health. That's my background. And in the world of epidemiologists, mm -hmm. they have emergency response plans mm -hmm. to respond to these emergencies. And that is what they do for a living. And it was lacking in terms of our PPE, our, our public health response, our safety for our, our citizens. So they don't get sick. They did get sick. Um, yes. It wasn't necessarily reported through the health department or through the hospitals, but it was an unintended consequence that could have been prevented. And I hope it's gonna be part of this plan. Thank you very much. So, um, so, I was, um, what does CAN stand for and what is that? Oh. So, so community, community Action Network. Capital Area Neighborhoods. Capital Area Neighborhoods. There you go. So much to learn. Oh, okay. Thank Thank you. You. But it, okay. the, look, that goes back to, to the uh, 09 uh, great financial crash when there was a lot of worry about like uh, seniors, et cetera, here? not having services support so it was a way of trying to organize the neighborhoods to check in on people who might be having financial difficulties yes yeah. and i think it speaks to and adrian brought this up as well that not everyone not everybody communicates or receives information in the same way and so while the city was was putting out messages and Montpelier Live was putting out messages, there are folks that just don't receive messages in that way. So we have to sort of diversify the way that messages get out, even if it's your next door neighbors knocking on Ms. McGillicuddy's door and saying, what do you need? Here's some water and this is what's happening, right? And that's the beauty of this, right? I think our whole concept here is Montpelier is small enough, <laughs> we're large, but we're small enough that what Adrian just described as your experiences in the you know can leader is, you get, you know exactly everyone in your neighborhood and what they need and how they get information, be it a knock on the door or social media or an email. And the only way to do that is at that level of granularity and it layers. So that's like the surefire way that everyone in that neighborhood is getting communicated to. And then there's like layers from there up to the city and then the state. And great point about the public health. And Dan and Adrian. I hope you'll welcome a call when we get to that and we reach out to you and say, what what yeah. experience and knowledge can you help oh, share yeah. with us? I'm, we still use that structure in our neighborhood all the time. So. By, by the way, I do have the database of the original leadership. So. Thank you. Fantastic. That'll be super useful. Yes. So, um, I, I, wanted, um, I, I want to also make a pitch for the um, having social services and mental health be part of the any planning for emergency response. Um, I'm still in my um, 
therapy practice, I'm still, you know, obviously still, it isn't that long, I'm still supporting people and picking up the pieces mm -hmm. of their traumatic reactions to the flood, and I'm sure that's true for yes. any therapist in, in the area. Um, I, I would love for there to have been a, um, and for there to be kind of a structure to, to mobilize a much more organized response. Um, there's a group of um, trauma therapists from the Burlington area who I know were um, reaching out down here and kind of trying to send, um, essentially sending therapy missionaries down here mm -hmm. to try to provide um, care to people in our community. And it wasn't really, I, I think that they figured it out, but they figured it out in a very granular way. I think without there being a clear, any kind of clear network for how they could connect to our community and find out what was needed and send who was needed and um, do stuff like that. And, um, you know, I have 10 million ideas and probably anybody working in the field that I work in has 10 million ideas about, about how this how, how this could be done, but it's a really, um, you know, mental health really is one of the other words that wasn't mentioned in, in the, at least in, in the large group conversation. And, and um, visibly and invisibly, it's a very big piece of how all of the communities affected are, are responding and reacting. Thank you very much for that. Yeah. And, yeah. and thank you for noting that it's another, it felt yeah. like another absence, because we actually have had many discussions about the role yeah. this plays and, and even just trauma, you know, how to yeah, acknowledge totally. it in yeah. big groups like tonight, you know, yeah. in, in the proper way. So thank you very, very yeah, much. Yeah, and, and I'm, total, I'm totally happy to be, you know, I, I, have, I have time to be involved in this conversation. So Fantastic. Helpful, so. Thank you. So but before we move on, I'm going to walk out of the hall and ring the bells. You're <laughs> yeah. welcome to stay here, but if you wanted to make sure that you hit somewhere else, it's going to be time to move in just a minute. I'll be okay. back. Give back. us like maybe a grace period. A minute 30. Sure. I just quickly want to make a pitch too. Like, I mean, this is, I feel like excellent feedback and it's exactly right. Right. And the goals of this kind of group coming out of it are things like that comprehensive response plan, right. That is actionable for businesses, individuals in the city, right. The neighborhood network that helps with that neighbor to neighbor assistance, but also like this, this thing that Suzanne is really leading of this long-term recovery group. I just want to talk like really quickly like what that is like we've seen incredible response to support businesses right and the municipality but really what to be frank like you know I think the original narrative coming out of the flood was like our downtown businesses are devastated and in Barry it's all residential right and in fact it's a much more complicated narrative right so 400 individual households or individuals applied for FEMA assistance, right? And so across the state, this is not like Montpelier inventing something new. There's systems with the Agency of Human Services. Leah's a representative from Capstone who's working on part of this to really set up, you know, you've got, if your house gets devastated, you've got insurance, you've got FEMA, you've got the state fund of last resort, and then you have your neighbors and you're never gonna be made whole, right? And so this final gap is the work of this long-term recovery group and it's not just, it's financial resources, but it's labor, it's materials, it's support, emotional support, all of those things. And so I would just really encourage you folks, as you're kind of like spreading the word about the work that this commission's doing, there's an opportunity for everybody to get engaged right now in this long-term recovery group. We need more members in it, and, and we need additional energy. So I want to give space for anyone who wants to get up and move to Watershed or Adaptive Downtown. Um, thank you so much. This is exactly the type of conversation we're looking at. This is not the end. Yeah. Yeah. The opportunity oh, that's that's nice to meet you. Oh, nice Judy to meet you. Walk is my name. Eric North. Um, thanks for those who stayed, and we'll get even get more into it. Um, so, anyone coming this way, you think? Anyone coming? We'll give it a minute. Okay. 
Um, we'll get started and we'll let people join as they come. Hi to the newcomers and thanks for those who uh, were part of our last <coughs> round. Um, we actually just had a great um, you know, feedback session, which is exactly what we're looking for. So just another recap. Um, this is the emergency response preparedness. You know, how can we be prepared in light of the next, um, the next one, be it flood or whatever it might be. Um, and we just had some amazing conversation around the community action networks, um, local sort of neighborhood alert systems. Some people have had experience actually currently being on those um, and some gaps and you know great feedback that was identified. And we have Suzanne here as well as a resource to talk about long-term recovery. So um, I'm just gonna open it up to folks because we just had a really robust and I could tell there was more ideas percolating that we didn't even get to. So yes. Um. I would just like to talk about long-term recovery. Great. And I don't have my prop with me tonight. I wish I did. It's a, a, a tape measure. Mm -hmm. But the tape measure goes up to here, OK? That's how high the water was in my house on mm -hmm. Lower State Street. Mm -hmm. OK? We are still not in our houses. We were put through the meat grinder with FEMA and SBA and everything else. We are struggling. We're really tired with this. I'm unhoused still, um, and uh, FEMA's not helping me get a place anymore. Um, I just want people to be aware we're still out there in pockets. And we have nowhere to turn. So, thank you so much. And Andrea much. can attest to that. Yeah, she I came down to I visit my house. It's unbelievable. It's shocking. And it's not just Ed's house, it's many houses in Montpelier are almost unlivable. Mm -hmm. They and are. Our unlivable. neighbors live in places that we would never mm -hmm. you know, just and any, anybody want information on it? I'm an expert. I'm a FEMA expert, SBA expert. I'm a whole expert on the whole process. So. And how many people in Mount, how many people do you know in the same situation? <clears throat> I believe there are what seven substantially damaged homes, which means more than fifty percent of their value was damaged. And that means you you have two choices when you're substantially damaged. Choice number one, you have to elevate it two feet above the current flood level, which nobody knows yet, right. all right? Exactly. Or demolish at your expense. Hey. I really appreciate you sharing that. And it exposes so much of the complexities and the human element. <laughs> so if anybody yeah. wants to contact me, get any kind of information, mm -hmm. you're never going to be whole. Mm -hmm. Never. Mm -hmm. And flood insurance is not good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Flood insurance will pay for maybe a third of your total damage. So if you're ever flooded, you're never going to be whole again. Really cannot thank you enough for sharing that because we need to hear this exact story. And that's why we have a long-term recovery group. But as you're saying, I mean, we're nowhere. We're eight yeah. months in and we're nowhere. Yeah. Yep. Some yes. of us are ready to move a little bit, but we're told we can't move. Mm -hmm. All right. So there, this country has had so many natural disasters. It should be a seamless process. You're assigned people that work with you through the whole process. Yeah. I was on the phone yesterday for four hours with SBA because their portal to send them information wasn't working. <coughs> this is... Yeah. The nutty yeah. stuff yeah. that happens yeah. that just wants to, you just you just want to bang your head against yeah. the wall. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. Thank you. I'm so sorry you're going through that, and your experience does help because really, as someone said earlier, over 400 so seven homes, as you just mentioned, substantially damaged, over 400 homes affected, and I kind of think that's not really well known, you know, by your neighbors. I so. mean, I, I I'm staying in Barry, and the situation in Barry is just horrible. Horrible, horrible, horrible. I don't, it stunk so bad for weeks after the flood. I mean, those poor people. Mm -hmm. I mean, I feel lucky compared to yeah. a lot of people. We are collaborating with Barry, 
in some ways, and we hope to deepen that collaboration. We really want to use this to sort of make it better the yeah. next time. So I'm a good resource on Thank how you, to navigate the, the flood. I really appreciate it. And you mentioned layers of maddening bureaucracy is part of your oh. thing as well. And that's some of what we're trying to investigate. We just got off a call with folks from the Department of Financial Regulation who are doing some research on other tools in, in addition to flood insurance because there's this acknowledgement that they don't make you whole. And what does that look like? Could that be you know, for the city to buy, for the city to be umbrella, for residents, right? So I think there is an acknowledgement of what you're saying and trying to support. So what happens is every time you go a little step, you get a new yeah. person. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you start over no. from the beginning and yeah. you tell your yeah. I have my story memorized to every word and every inflection in my speech about it. And it happens all the time. Well, I appreciate you being here and yeah. being willing to say it yet again <laughs> to us because it does matter. Thank I'm lucky you. I can still laugh. But Thank, you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Kate. Hi, my name is Kate McCarthy. Um, I'm really encouraged to hear of these conversations with the Department of Financial Regulation because I have an idea rattling around in my head that has to do with better ways to help people get resources after the flood. You know, maybe it's a formal insurance program, but we've also seen an outpouring in this community. We know people who weren't affected who want to help, people who were affected who want to help, people who have flood insurance might not like to put their money toward that again. Mm -hmm. What might we do with that energy and those resources? And I wonder if there's some sort of community-driven, grassroots, mutual aid style, local insurance um, mm -hmm. product that would mm -hmm. be legal to create <laughs> and that would give people some sense of assurance that there's going to be something there for them mm -hmm. uh, and it's going to be less uh, traumatizing to access it than other more conventional resources. So this is an idea that I've made up, but I'm really glad. Um, <laughs> it's a mutual <laughs> yeah. like insurance tool. Great. It's on the list. It's, it's on the list and we will take the seed of your idea and see what's there. See if it can go. I love that. Thank you very much, Kate. This is um, this is how I cope with this is what are their ideas? How can we move forward? How can we sort of keep moving, right? Um, which is my own personal coping mechanism in the light of disaster. Yes, hi. Hi, um, I'm Catherine Provo and I, I just want to tell a tiny bit of our story and because I don't know if it's been brought up or not. Great. We live up, up mm -hmm. by Vermont College. Yeah. And the groundwater yeah. seeped in through the basement. Mm -hmm. We had a sump pump in the wrong spot. Mm -hmm. My husband and I stayed awake 38 straight hours mm -hmm. with two shop vacs. Mm -hmm. We were thrilled, lucky, came out way, way, way better than everybody else. But in terms of preparedness and adaptiveness, I don't I haven't heard anyone mention up on the top of the hill mm -hmm. they still get flooded. Mm -hmm. We're nowhere near the river. Mm -hmm. But it's just you know, I know we're not alone, but I just no. haven't heard that. In fact, that's say it. literally my personal experience up on the hill. My husband and I we borrowed shop backs from our neighbors and had exactly the same 36 hours that you did, and it was Shocking, you know, because yes. we weren't, we were not expecting that at all. And I think what you're saying is part of this general alertness of we are living in a different world now. It is a wetter world. It will always be wetter and we can need to be adaptive in all these ways. And, yeah. and maybe there, and you know, again, like lots of talk about like lifting up utilities and is there ways that we can all do that together? And this idea of maybe all of Montpelier can be privy to these conversations because they might be strategies we all yeah. want yeah. to. And it yes. doesn't have to be necessarily located by a, a stream, a river, a lake. Um, it can be groundwater driven in terms of preparedness and right. yes. setback. Uh, exactly. Thank you. For yes. the people on the hills, I'd be worried about a landslide. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Which would be yeah, pretty much deadly. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. No, go go ahead. I'll pass for the moment. Oh, I don't think anyone else has a comment. Okay. Um, well, I was just going to say, first of all, that I had a somewhat similar experience also at a higher elevation. Um, um, my sump pump kept up. I was very lucky, but you're at, I'm 100% with you that, that um, nobody is completely, you know, safe. Well, and yeah, yeah. yeah, and the thing was, I mean, we're sitting there thinking, what about our neighbors? Because three of the four neighbors were all gone. Mm. We couldn't even go check on their houses or anything. So. When you think about preparedness, 
that's great, but if you're holding down your own floor, you can't really go out and leave it up anywhere else. Yes. So. That's a very good point, by the way, and we can maybe get into that again with this group. The previous group, we did talk a lot about the idea of this community neighborhood action, which is a way to be connected with those neighbors as the first line of defense, sharing resources, calling, saying, can I go into your basement, check out on your you know, utility, whatever it is. So this is what we're very excited about, is we just feel like we've got the momentum in this small enough, you know, ready enough community that we can do that layer, that level of granularity that might support what you're saying, at least for neighbor to neighbor. Please go ahead. Uh, and then I was, I was also just going to circle back to what people were saying about public health, and mm -hmm. I, um, I also work in public health at the, and for the Vermont Department of Health, so maybe mm -hmm. we can talk a little more later Absolutely. about how we can collaborate. Would love to. And, and back to sort of our, the idea of this um, local emergency operations plan. The idea is you build the infrastructure and you build the relationships, including with the state folks, public health, right, like all the different levels when you're not in an emergency, so that when the emergency strikes, those relationships are there, you know who to call, you know who's the authority. I, we heard this, so we've heard this so much, and I think we'll still hear it. Who is the authority to say yes or no? And there was confusion, you know, and that's why there was like, not like, yes, this is the declaration of what to do with, you know, PPE or with mucking out or whatever that is. Um, so I think that's we're really focused on that as we create the plan, as we help create the plan. Can I build off of that? Go um, very, I, please. You know, so during the emergency, I worked for the state, and so we were in age of commerce, and so we were finding ourselves in the same kind of position, like who's responsible mm -hmm. for responding to the businesses or yeah. responding to, so we, we kind of made up the playbook a bit as we were going. I mean, the state does a really good job in terms of its emergency responsiveness mm -hmm. to saving lives and, and you know, clearing roads and, and you know, the things that have to happen first but you know, that plan like for the 48 hours after, like how do we support the businesses and the property owners with consistent information, you know, and, and, and to get through kind of the, now unfortunately there's a lot of experts in town, but um, you know, like having that roadmap of not just, you know, locally here, here's our roles, mm -hmm. you know, Katie and Alec were kind of making up, you know, like all of a sudden they're assigned, like you're right. in charge of businesses, you're in terms of, you know, charge of residents, like exactly. having that in, the plan in place and what's the role of the Chamber of Commerce, or what's the role of these other entities regionally or statewide. So, you know, whether it's me or, you know, somebody else um, in that position assigned at that at different agencies, it would be helpful for all of us Thank to you. know. Yeah, you know? I love it. And that's exactly the vision, Gary, is like very clear expectations now with enough time to actually practice. I mean, that's the thing that's yeah. beautiful. that They have trainings and they actually do practice it exercises everything from a sort of more of a intellectual tabletop of who's on first, this happens, who do you call, and who's in your, yeah. you know, speed dial, to actually, like, practicing a full activity of, you know, this disaster happens, what do you do? Um, so, right, having that established, then even, like, working it a little bit to make sure, and you're right, the city, the state, businesses, volunteers, this is what we've heard from a lot of people, too, mm -hmm. of just, like, who is in charge? And you know? practice it. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Carl. Um, we also have to be thinking about the technology we have and the technology we're going to have available to us because rainstorms of that intensity usually come with wind and the one we had didn't and mm -hmm. so we kept power so the sump pumps worked and the you know the shop vats worked but we need to be thinking about you know what happens in a storm that's more like a hurricane or a tropical storm Irene where you also have wind and you're likely to lose power so setting up those systems in advance as well. So, Ooh, there, there's, 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 yeah, really good, good point. point. Being realistic and very good. Point. Can I just add that yes. we, we were we were in conversations with um, with Plainfield, and they brought up the point of like cellular phones, like actually, or not like regular cell phones, but satellite phones, mm -hmm. um, like having another form of communication beyond like when the cell phone cell towers mm -hmm. go down, you can pick up a satellite phone if you all remember those the clunky things, but being able to have some form of communication. Mm -hmm. um, not sure that's a solution, but. You know, yep. Yeah. Well, we've heard people mention sirens and stuff, and there's a real variance of opinion <laughs> on that one. <laughs> I'll I'm say. Sure. Um, some of the things that, that I hear people talking about is sort of one of the elements that we've talked about. For example, knowing what happened to you last time, and then during blue skies times, thinking the next time the water comes, what do I need to do mm -hmm. so that you already know ahead of time? If there's wind, if there's power outage, if there's a forest fire, how am I going to respond to those things? And sort of not just knowing your own, so that there's the city has a responsibility, volunteer networks will have a responsibility, but each resident and each business owner will have, in some way, their own responsibility to know what you individually are going to need to do. And then, once networks are in place, be able to communicate that ahead of time. For example, 
if on December 18th, was it, the, when, when that had happened, mm -hmm. if we had already known from previous time, because we had had the perfect situation and enough time to prepare, which we didn't, but for example, that, oh, this business needs this many people to get stuff out of the basement, these businesses, this is how, what we need. Then when there's a flood of volunteers, there's already, the volunteer hub already knows these things. For example, all right, you take two people to Botanica, three people to Anna, four people go to Julio's or what have you. And similarly, with various um, neighborhoods, that, that type of pre-planning work during Blue Skies and then working on the, the exercises in between allows us to kind of be prepared when it happens. It's gonna take a lot of research development, yeah. implementation, and then keeping it alive because what happens to these types of plans in a lot of areas is you go years without something and then by the time it happens everybody who was experienced from last time has already died or moved away or whatever right. exactly. yeah. Yeah. I mean maybe this is part of your stakeholder analysis but I'll feel bad if I leave this room and don't say it um, the schools should also be involved um, you know when there's any type of you know delayed opening or like whatever they have the technology to send out to every single family in Montpelier and Roxbury so I just want to make sure that that is part mm. of your I mean it might be but I don't want to assume yeah. so yeah mm -hmm. thank you just yeah well this is why we're having this meeting now this is all in like the preliminary stages of development we've got our goal we got our priorities we want to hear input and now you know going into the actual sort of writing development phase and again there will be opportunities for I love that you're bringing it to life that example because that's like the exact point of like what do we need to do there are actually checklists for example that exist already that we've been looking at developing maybe like expanding upon for business for a resident you know what are your needs and I think we can do that um, back and forth but I think that's where we are not going to develop this in a closed room you know these have to be really responsive to the, the proper parties you know good point about the school sorry just yeah sure. <laughs> I'm thinking so are you partnering with the Vermont emergency management because that's I mean, I'm assuming they write the responsibility keys. Like, I would assume so they would take a lead role, but I have no idea. A couple things. Um, we have some folks that are part of immersive management and tangential to them on the commission. So we're in sort of like a real flow of information there. Um, and then, two, we've gotten incredible advisors who have already sort of like just said, Here's everything I know, call us anytime. You know what I mean? And they're the ones saying, you know, we have a training uh, that's for, you know, must take for anyone, you know, who's the municipal leaders who are the captains when this something happens. Um, and of course, the folks in the city, uh, you know, in city government who are those people are very responsive and say, yes, sign us up for the next you know, one. Um, so yes, and the beauty of this is every town has to have one of these in place and we do have one in place, but it's like the, first pass it's like the continuing operations right like what we've all seen now is it must be so much broader than that um to do all the things that sort of mark and, and we've been saying you know for businesses and residents um so that's the part that is not like mandated but it's done let me just say that it is done we, do, we are not creating this from scratch mm -hmm. you have to have a robust plan like this and we, we have templates and advisors who are going to help us to speak just a little bit more to that i mean in the case of the city for example the city has an excellent plan for what the city needs to do to maintain the city's um, assets and continue the operation so police, that it's there. Police, fire, yeah. Um, but it also cannot be our firefighters and police who come respond to the flood needs, in my personal opinion, because who's gonna to respond to a fire when all the firemen are mucking out basements? Who's gonna, you know, we, we need police and fire to be there to do the work of police and fire departments. but. There have been, so the city has a good plan. It's just limited in scope and doesn't include what are we gonna do at your house mm -hmm. when it's full of water, right? So there are other communities in Vermont. Bethel yeah. is, is one example that has a very robust plan. They unfortunately kind of let their plan die, but at its inception, mm -hmm. it, was, it, was, it was a really good plan and sort of laid out the volunteer networks will do this. Individual residents and businesses will be responsible for doing this. The government will be responsible for doing these things, and so we're using that as a—it's—it's it's not a jumping-off point, but it's a great reference point for us. Yes. Are we going to go off of that? Sure. No, go for it. Go for it. No. Um, I was just going to say, you know, the other thing that we can think about is, um, you know, sister communities that maybe are like in this last flooding event that we had. Not every like Addison County wasn't hit in the July floods. Well, if you have a sister community mm. in Addison County, oh, then nice. you could 
get equipment from or get supplies from or fans or whatever it is, it's not always going to work that way. Sure. Because it might be a you know a snowstorm that impacts the entire state of the earth. It could be a flood that's very isolated. But like, I think it begs us to kind of think that, about that a little bit because there's there's certainly a lot of even <coughs> across state borders into you know New Hampshire into New York where it might be able to get build those relationships a bit. So if you have an emergency, they can be at least aware and supportive, and you have that connection. I, that's a great idea. Thanks. I love that idea. Thank you. <laughs> I do keep thinking when I see the footage of what happened in Maine recently, I keep yeah. feeling like if we were three years down, we would be in such a much better position to sort of offer them our experience and our tools. But you know, we're still we're still working it out at this point. And we're actually thinking about the creation of this robust sort of you know LEOP, the long the emergency operations plan, as potentially a template that could be fillable PDF for every town right. of Vermont because we do feel like we've got the energy, yeah. we've got this commission, and every town needs one of these. Mm -hmm. And very few actually have them as like as big as we're thinking about this one. So we really actually would love to accelerate yeah. progress mm -hmm. elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Is there has there been discussion about how to keep the momentum going? I mean, assume the flood next flood isn't for ten years. Yeah. We all have a short memory. Yes. Mm -hmm. And everybody's gonna disperse and uh, nobody's gonna be here. So what ha how do we keep this going so that there's always somebody that's prepared or somebody with institutional knowledge that knows what to do. It's a great question. Yeah. And the, the answer is, no, we're not, because you're not going to let us do that, and we're not going to let us do that. I mean, and that's a very pie-in-the-sky kind of notion, but it has to be written into the thing of what is the schedule and who are the players that need to come together every six months, every 12 months, what have you, rain or shine, mm -hmm. do tabletop exercises, do broader live exercises or what have you. And one cool thing that we've been learning is we're getting to know this language and this this plan and you know what it is all about is that it's like really the in an emergency you need the captain and the deputy right and they can they don't need to be specific humans they don't even need to be specific positions it's actually more about the personality like is this a good manager under stress almost a choreographer and so you can sort of write that into this emergency operations like plan and then you know uh, center and you, that those people could be even changing depending on you know um turnover and other things but to mark's point is you have to have a practice schedule and you have to keep to it because again this isn't just for floods this could be for anything right. um so that's one very mechanical i think answer to your question as far as momentum i spend a lot of time thinking about that bigger picture question um how do we really get consensus and rally our community together around making big possible changes here that are really going to make us more resilient, more, you know, flood ready for the next time, you know, probably even more in the watershed adaptive downtown groups, big projects maybe that we've not been able to move to completion yet they've been in every plan for the last 35 years. Why? And that's a big part of this commission is understanding where did it get stuck and can we unstick it? And I believe your point about keeping momentum and energy is the only way we're going to really make major change that could really truly make us more resilient. And public education is a big part of that. I think we, we, what we're seeing is a lot of these projects are related to flood mitigation and no one's connected those dots. It's like we've been able to move X forward. If we come together and say, you know what, that saves this many feet of flood, you know, storage next time around, which means this many millions of dollars in sort of like savings and heartbreak and really tell that story and connect these dots. We have a moment now that I think we have to take advantage of to make systemic changes that will last, you know, on their own. So anyway, that's just a more philosophical, I think, response to you because the public education piece of this, I think, is going to be critical. And you'll see that in the next year as this all rolls out. Just a two-minute heads up. I'm going to ring the bells in a couple of minutes. Bell man. Okay. Thank you. I just want to ask if you've... Um looked into the incident command system at all because the structure you were just mm -hmm. describing with people mm -hmm. stepping into those roles that 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 is like that is the incident command mm -hmm. system absolutely and actually I, I happen to personally have had some experience post irene in okay. government and uh the vtrans incident command centers was sort of like <gasps> what made that response happen mm -hmm. and i just talked to scott rogers who actually works national life now who is just like doesn't live in montpelier but said put me in coach i'm ready to advise you all any way you want i want to see this succeed and he was in charge of those incident command centers so just to, just to show you a little bit of like the behind under the hood how, mm -hmm. what we're doing in the commission who we're talking to and it's amazing who's coming out to say i want to help however i can and it's that sort of expertise that's just been invaluable thank you did i have a 
question over here? Comment? No? If not, I Adrian, go on. I want to respond to this gentleman's, I think sustainability is like, mm -hmm. like should be actually at the forefront. Mm -hmm. So to answer that, you should be able to answer that first and mm -hmm. thinking about where this lives and how do you put it into policy so that yes. it's held accountable over the long term. So, I mean, is it a part of the city structure? Like this plan, like where did, like this yes. should be part of your planning right now because this needs to have a home. Yes. So who is going to own it? I think it should be a big P. I think it should be part of a policy that is held accountable, that is required to have those two annual, you know, whatever. But I don't know if it lives in the commission. I don't know where it lives, but I think you, the part of this process is that should really be like on the top yeah. rather than like going to do all this stuff. Like where is it going to live and who is going to own this? Um, because it could just die. I've yeah. seen programs like this die, and it's terrible. Yeah, <laughs> it's such a such a good point. I just wanted to speak to that for a second. The commission isn't meant, as you heard Ben sort of say, yeah. is not meant to be necessarily a permanent structure, yeah. but we're more like a catalyst or a, um, an incubator. And so the example of this plan, the reason why I love this one, it's like, this is a little bit less tricky because it's super concrete. Mm -hmm. There is literally a plan that will be a product and then we will have an exercise. And this one is more straightforward. It really needs to be embedded in the mechanics of city government. Mm -hmm. And um, that's where it's supposed to live. That's where it's supposed to live by like law through you know emergency management. Mm -hmm. And that's why the first conversation we had was with the city. And I just want to say again, like it was an incredible conversation because they said, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, we know we need this and we could just, we really appreciate the capacity. We have so much to do. We would love to spend all of our energy on this, and we just simply cannot, right? So I think they really see us as partners, bless you, and sort of added, added capacity. But we got that buy-in early so that they, because we said, let's just, no assumptions here. We're not going to go right, help you write this big plan and get all these, you know, consultants in if it's not going to become embedded. And, you know, let's just make sure we're not mincing words from day one and really we're all on the same page about that. But it's a very good high level point. I believe every project this commission touches that you'll hear in all these different groups, they're gonna have different answers about where they live, what's the long term sustainability plan. You rang the bell. Okay. Thank you so much everyone. This is just the beginning. Thanks. Keep keep it coming. <laughs>